from New York. Ebro in the morning. On Hot 97. Sean King, uh, you work for the Daily News, but you also have been writing for yourself. You've been blogging. You've been helping community organizations organize. You've been on the show. Uh, whether it's... Um, you know, people divesting from banks around the Dakota Access Pipeline all the way to Colin Kaepernick to uh, today we're dealing with uh, the 42nd Precinct in the South Bronx. Um, that's what you do. You you deal with the problems head on. Yeah. The big ones. Yeah. The I scary mean, ones. I, that's my hope. Yeah. So, I mean, in the, in the 42nd Precinct, it was a problem I didn't even know existed. and uh, And that's part of the problem in and of itself is gentrification has changed how we see bad policing because stuff that used to happen in the neighborhood where most of us live in now no longer happens there they've changed like i live in downtown brooklyn and a lot of the methods of bad policing used to happen in downtown brooklyn but as gentrification has happened there the things they used to do in downtown brooklyn police no longer do they've pushed those methods and tactics out to brownsville and so in, in the stuff that used to happen in Harlem, they've pushed it up into the Bronx. And so I don't see it every day the way you may have seen it every day 15 years ago. Well, there's, and there's a couple of layers to this. There, um, you brought up gentrification, which we talked about around the Mike uh, uh, Eric Garner situation Absolutely. over in Staten Island. Yep. Right. Um, there's also what is known as broken windows policing, right? which is a layer of this where it's just kind of like based on the idea that where there are broken windows, there are is potentially more crime mm. or criminals, mm -hmm. right? It's kind of a a theory. Uh, but in this quota system that you're uncovering in many of your uh, articles that are un um, that you're putting out over the last few days, um, police and the NYPD, we had a conversation with them. They admit that they used to go into an area and kind of scoop up everyone and do raids and not really focus on the people doing the problem, but kind of focus on the entire neighborhood. Yeah. Um, well, but let, let, you've gone deeper and you're saying stop and frisk is gone, but these things are still happening. So, okay, it depends on how much time we have, but let me, let me try to break it all the way down. So three days after Trump was inaugurated, I was in here the yep. day after Trump was inaugurated. Right. Two days after that, so three days after Trump was inaugurated, the, the city of New York settled a lawsuit that was filed seven years ago called Stinson versus New York. It was the largest police corruption lawsuit the city has ever settled. It was for $75 million. And they settled it in the, in the, the craziness of the Trump inauguration. It got almost no coverage, not even here locally. Literally, there are two articles in the entire world written about it, and it's the largest settlement mm. ever. And what for, was it based on? What was the For $75 million. It's going to blow your mind. I posted it in my piece. The city admitted that it had committed over the previous eight years 900,000 false arrests. Mm. It's an insane not, number. Not 900. 9,000, I think, would be crazy. 90,000 would be like, oh, my God. 900,000. And they agreed to dismiss. Over how long? Sean? Over eight years. So you're talking about 120,000 false arrests per year. They agreed to dismiss all 900,000 of them. Yeah, and we and talked then, about that on the air. Remember I said that they were doing this whole, I think I posted on it too on my Instagram, that they were doing this whole thing about uh, dismissing a lot of these arrests or people well, see, who they had were warrants doing that the, were... Well, see, this was, it was a class action lawsuit. A brother named Shalik Stenson and, and 15 others who filed it seven years ago. And in the, in the shadows of the Trump inauguration, so it wouldn't get coverage, the city settled it. So 900,000 false arrests, they agreed to dismiss them, expunge them from people's records, and pay the victims of those false arrests $75 million, the largest single settlement for police corruption the city has ever had, and no one talked about it. Now, what that tells us is, officially or unofficially, the NYPD has the practice of false arrest. So before I ever even knew that that lawsuit exists, I'm up in the Bronx, talking to families who are telling me my son has been falsely arrested five times, 10 times, 25 times. I met a family whose son mm. had been falsely arrested 50 times. And here's what I mean by falsely arrested. He would be arrested for anything from marijuana possession to disorderly conduct to attempted murder, serve a few weeks, a few months, or a year at Rikers, and it would be dismissed. 
50 different times her son had cases that were dismissed. And so people in the community are like, damn, Junior's a thug. Junior can't stay out of trouble. What's wrong with Junior? Only to find out that the problem wasn't Junior, it was the NYPD, and that they were willing, in order to meet quotas in the city to this very day, you'll see them, they, the NYPD, the chief uh, of patrol tried to call me out yesterday on Twitter. I'm I saw going, you post that. You're going I'm, to meet with yeah, them. Yeah, I'm going to meet with them today at 3. And he said in his reply, we never had quotas. Well, we know, and you all know, from a group of 12 officers, the NYPD 12. 12, 12 brave, award-winning, upstanding officers who've done amazing work, have come forward and put their life and their careers on the line to say, actually, the chief, the commissioner, the mayor, and others who deny that there are quotas, they're lying. There are quotas, and we've, we've recorded conversations, we've taken photos, we have evidence, and these people have put their entire lives on the line. Turns out, and this is in my piece, that's the seventh lawsuit from a group of officers saying that there are quotas. So before the NYPD 12, there were six other lawsuits from not fired officers, not disgruntled officers, but officers who love their job and hate crime who say there are quotas. Now, here's what I don't understand. If I'm in possession of marijuana or disorderly, con you know, I'm out drinking in the street, loud, whatever, whatever, and I get arrested on disorderly conduct, and, the, and, the, and it gets dropped. No, hold on, hold on. These are kids who are being arrested when there was no disorderly conduct. So there was there not was even a kids arrested. There, there, kids arrested for crimes they didn't commit. And I, I detail all of those. I'm in the middle of a five part series, and case by case by case, kids charged with possession of cocaine. There was no cocaine. Yeah. Charged with possession of marijuana. Mm -hmm. There was no marijuana. Charged with gun possession, there was no gun. There is in his piece. There's a video because he shows he adds. If you if you go through it step by step, you can see all the lawsuits. But you can see one of the videos, and I don't remember this young man's name. He's clearly just walking down the street, and he gets attacked by police officers. And he, they they said that he had clear bags and and you know green leafy substance, and the kid had nothing. So yeah, so you can Laura, see his hands move. He had nothing. And let me break that down. So that was Jatik Stenson. And this was in 2012, right around when Ramarley Graham was killed. Mm -hmm. And he is literally walking home. He gets mobbed by officers because they were told by Detective David Terrell, who was the focus of my of my previous piece. Who's on the cover of the New York Post today. I just handed right. you the yeah. article who's claiming that the NYPD would rather pay than support him because he had, what, 30 complaints against him? Is that it, Rosenberg? You have the paper over there. Let's see. He said 36 complaints. 36 complaints. And NYPD's paying out because they're saying that his arrests were false and they're pinning it on him. Well, here's what the NYPD is going to do. And several officers within the department tomorrow, in a piece I'm releasing tomorrow, go on the record. And they told me this three weeks ago that the NYPD in the city, they told me we're going to try to use Terrell as their fall guy. I've written over a thousand stories about police brutality. He is one of the worst human beings I've ever covered. He is a terrible, terrible man. He, four different women went on the record, four women who didn't know each other, who didn't know other women were saying this, went on the record saying, he said, I will stop arresting your kids if you have sex with me. Wow. Four different that. women said that. And as soon as they turned him down, the, he was going after their Here, other kids. And here's who one That's of those unreal. kids was, and this is how I learned about Terrell and learned about this, one of those kids was a young brother, Pedro Hernandez, Hernandez, whose mother, Jessica Perez, he crossed the wrong woman. His mother, Jessica Perez, 15 years ago, took the NYPD test, was thinking about becoming an officer. She has a legal mind. She's a sharp, fierce woman. And he tried to pull this stuff with her. When she turned him down, she documented it. She filmed it. He literally got her phone number from an arrest record of her 14-year-old son. Mm. Began calling her at home. She documented these things. She eventually changed her number because of the harassment. And he starts literally arresting Pedro over and over and over again. Mind you, he's in ninth grade, 10th grade, missing months of school at a time. And every single case was bogus, false. Just because his Terrell guy wanted to have sex with her. He, absolutely. And he did it not just with Jessica Perez. Multiple he did women. it with a sister named Elizabeth Rosado. 
and they documented it. These women, when they finally realized they were being preyed upon, took the right measures to document it. And here in about six weeks or so, there's going to be a class action lawsuit against Detective David Terrell and the NYPD because they reported this to the police. This wasn't last year. This wasn't two years ago. We document. He's been doing this stuff for 12 years with every police commissioner, every mayor. So everybody wants to pass the buck. But the problem is not just Terrell, but the people who've gone out of their way to protect him. And so now he feels like he's hanging high and dry because we're putting the pressure on him. Now he's on the front page of the New York Post. Mm. And the NYPD is saying, Yo, that's so crazy. Yeah. It's I have like a question. A movie. Uh, here's my Yo, this is so, can we stop for a second before you question? I want to, but N- no, my of- question's about how crazy it is. Is there any other job in the world in which, even if people didn't have Come evidence, on. if 36 different complaints that they're like, hey, 36 people are saying you're doing terrible things and they don't know each other. What the hell is going on here? This has to change. Well, here's what's crazy. Here's what's crazy, Rosenberg. The city has already paid out millions yeah, but they're, they're of dollars. Admitting Dang. that by the payout, you're admitting that, yo, there's a problem here. The city has paid. And see, here's the thing. At the point in which the complaints are filed, the lawsuits are filed, the lawsuits are settled, and they keep him. And not only that, and this is what I'll ask the, the chief today when I meet with him, uh, they gave him promotion yep. after promotion. It wasn't like they froze his career. He rose up to detective. Now, that's a discretionary promotion. That's a promotion that your supervisors choose to give you. So they saw this brutality. And here's what uh, uh, Sergeant Edwin Raymond told me. He said, Sean, when I was going through the academy, they told us that if you weren't getting CCRBs, those are the complaints that he has piled up, if you don't get CCRBs, you're not doing it right. Because I asked What's Raymond. What's a CCRB? A CCRB is a, is, is a complaint from the Citizens Civilian Complaint, complaint okay. yeah, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Okay, got it. Cool. And Sergeant Raymond told me, he said, Sean, five would be wild, five complaints. He said, 10, something's terribly wrong. He said, Sean, 30, at the point in which you've reached 30, it's a conspiracy. He said, there's no way someone has 30 complaints and everybody in the department in the city is not aware of it because by the time you get 30 complaints, that means people have paid money. Fair. That means that, yeah, I mean, it, and so at this point, the city has bent over backwards to protect him because he never really went viral. There was no real pressure because as long as it was a few families in the middle of the projects in the Bronx talking, the city was willing to keep paying out, paying out, paying out, but now he's on the front page of the paper. And so the city wants to be like, yeah. He's a bad guy, but what I'm saying is, you created him. He's the he is the uh, Frankenstein or, or even, you created. Or even you allowed him to exist. You didn't. Right. You didn't take the. You didn't take the steps to get rid of him. Well, here's how they created him. They created him because, with police quotas. quotas well, yeah, are yeah. Saying, I'm saying yes and. You yeah, yeah, that's him, right. Yes you and. Cre- you created him and protected him because here's the thing: two different brave officers, a man and a woman, in the, in his precinct, the 42nd precinct, sued the department saying that the quota system there was fierce and the and the officers who were willing to arrest people whether they were guilty or not rose up through the system that's terrell and the ones who would not participate could never get promoted would get harassed demeaned ridiculed and sometimes transferred to desk duty and other things so the the system that his supervisors created saying listen we need each of you to have 35 arrests this month we want five of them to be on drugs four of them to be on guns so they would just go out and arrest four people for guns, whether they had guns or not. Five people for drugs, whether they had drugs or not. Now later, those charges often would be dismissed, but here's where it gets ugly. We're meeting kids who said, Sean, Terrell arrested me for drugs. The DA said, listen, if you plead guilty, we'll give you six months probation. The kid's are like, okay, I'll plead guilty. So now we're learning not of dozens, but of thousands of, of kids, adults, men, women, boys and girls, who pled guilty to crimes they didn't commit because they were given deals for time served or for probation, and they just thought, I'm gonna get back to my family. And so it's a it's a deep hustle. Now is this is now and that's where I wanted to go on the hustle because there's certain thing certain bundles I'm seeing here. There's the gentrification bundle, yeah. which is you have these multi million dollar development companies coming into an area saying, Hey, we will uh, build South Bronx happening right now. Right. The, the same people who developed Williamsburg is over in the South Bronx buying it up. Yep. We want this land, tax dollars for the city, 
bring in wealthy families, change this area around. Are you saying that the people who are doing this are also in cahoots or working in some concert with the police to put pressure on the community to clean things up, to get people to either move out or imprison people so that they're gone and out of the way so they can develop the area? Is that what you're well, saying? What you, well, what you see is the worst methods of policing are happening in communities that are targets for developers for gentrification. And so, so do you, I'm going to just jump there. Do you believe that these developers are somehow uh, I, paying or creating an atmosphere where there's money being exchanged so that these areas get cleaned up in a faster rate so money can be made by everyone involved? It's hard, it's hard to say. Like, I, I, I'm like you, and I would believe anything. My mind is open to it. But again, it creates... It creates the opportunity when the city knows, listen, we'll be able to eventually redevelop or change this community. It'll, it, it creates an allowance for this type of policing to happen. Now, whether it's campaign donations or something like that, I haven't dug into it enough to be able to say definitively, but I would believe something like that. So then exist. the other bundle would be the bail racket because we know the bail system's a absolutely. racket so is this a part of that bail racket absolutely and that's why so bless you thank you when i first learned of pedro's story um some amazing people reached out from the robert kennedy center for human rights and they saw something that i did not notice and that's why they latched on to pedro's case this is carrie kennedy daughter of robert kennedy saw the piece that i wrote about pedro and they saw a critical mistake the city and the DA in the Bronx made. Here's what they did. Pedro is sitting at Rikers. He graduates from high school, gets a full scholarship offer to go to college, but he's stuck at Rikers, and they set his bail at $250,000. Then when the family said, well, we could, we could raise the 10% to get him out for $25,000, they then removed the 10% stipulation and said, no, you have to pay all two fifty. dollars in essence, making it such that the family can never do it. Well, the Bronx DA made a huge mistake. The Bronx DA then says, Pedro, we will let you out if you take a plea right now and say you say you did it, and we will let you out on time served. He refuses because he didn't do it. There are witnesses saying he didn't do it. And obviously his mom, his mom is a strong woman. She's mom is fighting. The there's, a, there's an amazing a private investigator, Manuel Gomez, who's on it. People have even identified the young brother who did do the shooting. So Pedro's like, no, I'm not going to do it. He thought about taking the deal because he desperately wanted to get out of Rikers. So when he turns the deal down, here's what happened. And they walked into a constitutional crisis and they're kind of backed into a corner. When you say, we will let you out if you take a plea for guilty, it is in essence saying, you are not a threat to the community. We believe you are safe enough to the community that we will let you out this afternoon so if you take a plea. So why was the bail so high in the first place? So why is the bail? Because so at the moment in which he said no, they then said, well, yeah, the bail is still two fifty, and you have to pay it all because you are a threat to the community. But well, the, the lawyers at the RFK Center said, ah, you revealed your hand because either he is a threat to the community or he's not a threat to the community. And what what they saw is they are using the bail system in a way that is unjust and illegal so the seeing that the rfk center which blew my mind paid all two hundred fifty thousand dollars in cash to go get pedro out of there found him a new criminal defense attorney and his case is at the center of that and i'm going to go deep on his case on friday and uh, his case is symbolic of all that's wrong with this be it david terrell be it this system of bail reform that's necessary but they're using bail as a hustle to keep people in and to make a lot of money for the city, and uh, it's 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 deeply disturbing. And I would not believe it if I didn't see it with my own eyes. If I didn't see the destruction it's caused. If I didn't see, you know, after Khalif Browder died, so many officials in this city said, "Never again. We won't let this happen again. These false arrests, keeping people in Rikers for years on end. We won't let that happen again. It's not just happening with Pedro." It's happening with hundreds of kids, many of which are, are at Rikers right now. It's interesting because while we talk about the chess game or what we're hearing is some sort of like you have this Terrell guy who just has, wants to have sex with women. So to try to have sex with women, he's arresting their children to just be a, a, 
I don't even know how to describe that. On, on air. The guy, no, the guy's a monster. Listen, He's man. like Denzel from Training Day on steroids, yeah. is what but it sounds like. No, well, people, right, people right, call I guess, him that. Yeah, but, people but this people is use where that I'm analogy going. with him all the time. But this is where I'm going. So, And then we're talking about this bail system, and we're talking about people making money, and we're talking about gentrification. But at the bottom, at the root of all this, are kids. Yes, Absolutely. whose lives right? are being Who destroyed. We're, put, we're putting so much effort into figuring out how to make money on locking kids up. When that effort could be put on figuring out ways to help kids be successful. Listen, I've, or, met, I've met these kids here, bro. These kids are brilliant, man. Like, I, I had literally, I was sitting at an IHOP with Pedro two days ago. The brother is brilliant, and, and they are they are killing the, the ambition and the shine that these kids have because what they experience when they go into Rikers, oh, man. It, 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 it's, it's, my series is called Soul Snatchers. And they're snatching the souls out of these kids' lives because what they experience at Rikers. You know, there's a video of Pedro being beaten and choked, almost unconscious by a guard. I mean, it's what they're experiencing when they get in there. And then they throw and them so, in solitary confinement, which destroys them mentally. Absolutely. We had uh, Carmen Perez up here, and I forget yeah. the other young man's name. Supreme, Supreme Rivera. Supreme, yeah. who came up uh, representing Pedro yep. and been working on the front lines yep. of this. Absolutely. Uh, I, we'd be uh, it'd be messed up of us to not acknowledge. There are individuals who have been working on getting this the proper attention oh, yeah, for, for for a decade, longer de- than that. Yeah. yeah. Um, because this is not new activity, but having the a person like yourself who has uh a job that, you know, you can feed your family on and do this type of work. Yeah. Uh social media and people sharing information. Uh, obviously camera phones and all of the things that are allowing us to get a, a, a closer look at this stuff. Or even, you know, like when, when Jay-Z and, and the Weinstein brothers did a documentary on Khalif, yes. all of a sudden it's it's on prime time for five different nights. It puts a spotlight on this issue in a way that local activists have been doing for their entire that's lives. Right, that's right. So I'm, I, Jay-Z and I are late comers to this. That's right. So people on the ground like Carmen and the Justice League and others – They've been fighting day in and day out. And even even before myself, before Carmen, in the literally people in the 70s and the 80s and 90s were Tamika fighting Mallory. this. Tamika Mallory. Look, to me, a lot of people don't know, Tamika Mallory used to work for Sharpton. That's how I met yeah. Tamika Mallory. Right. right. She was in charge of the youth division of yeah. National Action, Action Network. So a lot of people see Carmen or Tamika and they're like, who are these new folk? No, they've been It's like, there. no, they're new to you. But Carmen been worked the for Belafonte <laughs> right. for the last 12 right. years. Carmen, Carmen has been doing what she's doing today since she was a kid. Like, literally, since they were teenagers. Like, this is who they are. And so they've set the stage, and I'm able to come in here and give a larger audience to it. But people have been saying this, but now we do. We have these platforms where we're able to, like, I'm putting my series, I'm putting it out myself. Whereas 20 years ago when, almost 30 years ago now, when Gary Webb revealed what was happening where where the United States was using money from the drug trade to fund wars in different countries. When Gary Webb's newspaper said, listen, we're going to stop publishing this, Gary got stuck. Because when Gary did this, there was no Twitter, there was no Facebook, there weren't blogs. If a newspaper wouldn't publish it, he had no other outlet. But that's not our issue now. So now we have, not only do we have radio shows just like this, but we have our own platforms, and it puts a ton of pressure. Because listen, Terrell's on the cover of the New York Daily News, I mean, the Post. New York Post today, because we put pressure on him for the past four days. And had we not put that pressure using our own platforms yeah. and influence, yep. they weren't talking about Terrell. And the NYPD reaching out to you over Twitter, because wanting they, to have a conversation. Because they feel the heat. And, uh, you know, now, I do believe, based on our meetings with the NYPD, that the, there are people there now that are in charge who have inherited some of this stuff. But I do believe it is their responsibility to now um, deal with it yeah. head on I agree. so that we, yeah. if we are truly trying to make our police department here in New York City uh, the best it can be, and, you know, comparatively to other major cities, it's remarkable uh, based on just the size of the city and the and the stuff that goes on and the history of it. Like, yeah. if you look at the history of the NYPD, it's not a, it's not a pretty one. And it, it's it's a an incredibly complex, horrible system to inherit to reform. It's like, it's it's not an easy job, and people don't. It's not a popular thing to say. There are good cops in the NYPD, plenty who stand against it. Some of them are doing the work behind the scenes because some of us are insiders. 
Some of us work within the system and do the hard work quietly, and some of us are outsiders. And we speak out, we protest, and we do it in a different way. But I've met a hundred legitimately great cops who hate police brutality, who want reform, who speak up for victims. They just don't get the airtime that they deserve. And so um, I, I agree with everything you said word for word. My thing is they say they want it to get better, but are you willing to make the current pain that, that people still have? Pedro still has an open case. Yep. Like, you know, so it's not like the, the chief told me in his tweet. He said, listen, you're talking about the past. I'm like, listen, man, I profile. A, listen, I detail 120 crimes that David Terrell has committed. I'm not talking about, like, hey, he's a bad dude. The guy has committed crimes. That's not. Yeah, he committed those in the past, but he still works for your department. So what do you so what do you want the chief to do right now? How, what could he say to you after your meeting? He goes, you know what? You're right. What do you want him to do? He, it means I'm, we're going to investigate and, and then and likely, in all likelihood fire uh, Terrell? So I was, I was glad the chief reached out to me, but I told him, frankly, in my reply that he started his reply out with a lie. In his very first sentence, in his reply to me, he says, we've never had quotas. And if that's where you're going to start, then I have a problem. If you want to attack this problem, you can't pretend it doesn't exist. And so I, I was encouraged that he replied and then simultaneously discouraged because they're not willing to admit that the problem is there and so they have to admit that quotas existed and then start the complicated system of dismantling that. and you know it might be word choice too because i've definitely heard them talk about hits before Hits, With, performance it's, standards uh you yeah, know they, they, have code they don't for yeah it. they have other words they use instead of quotas because obviously quota would be illegal. So they're using other words like, you know, we're going to make some hits. So they go to certain neighborhoods where they know there are people who cause problems and they make hits. They just, you know, shake the trees a little bit and see what they come up with. Those are all the words they use, man. And my thing, we don't have to use the word quota. Whatever word describes, they set guidelines for how many people they want to arrest. And then they follow those guidelines and they create 10 different adjectives to describe those guidelines and they try to keep it unofficial. It's not in the policy manual, but it, it's on the boards. It's in the conversations. And members of the NYPD 12 recorded those conversations, released those conversations. And and, and, I, mean, and, I, and I think as a community, uh, Sh uh, Shani brought this up the other day, and we talk about it often, where we live in a time where we're used to getting everything instantly. Yeah. Right? And so when you see wrongdoing, it's like, well, fix it. Change is slow, man. Yeah. Change and I is... think that's the piece in, in this uh, that your you know work you're doing, the conversation you're gonna have today with the NYPD, the conversation we have with the NYPD, is you know dealing with the years it's gonna take, not yeah. months. Yeah, years it's gonna take, and cultural and behavioral changes They're that difficult. it's gonna take yeah. for us to get to a place where you don't some somebody like this officer Terrell knows firsthand that this... I mean, how long has Terrell been a, a police officer? Almost 20 years, man. Almost 20 years So what the was the NYPD 20 years ago when he first got in there? Right. So he, he he walked into a system. He came up in a system. Right. But my thing is, he was doing this stuff a few months ago. Right. And so when the chief or the commissioner say, listen, we've changed, it's like... Oh, I, I, yeah, I, but that's like, I, I hear know. what you're saying, but... So, so, so Rosenberg, what else has to happen? They have to fire David Terrell. And firing David Terrell is essential because he's brutalized families, he's committed crimes, and uh, I've asked the Attorney General's office here in the state to launch an independent investigation I'm into gonna that. I'm going to tell y'all right yeah. now, the reason that's going to be hard is because then he's going to squeal on everybody else. He's going he's gonna to file wrongful termination and say that you guys encouraged what I was doing, it was all good, blah, blah, blah. You're as accountable as I'm accountable, and it's going to be an effing mess. And yes. that's how people like that keep working. Very good point. And then they have to be willing to, when they do that, say, uh, own up to that, yes, practices used to be different, and we used to run a different operation, and, different and we don't do it. Sorry. It's and over. there's a new commissioner who's only been on the job a year. That's yeah. the I wasn't part. here when you was doing all but that. But you so can't move forward. Fed. You can't be move forward unless you acknowledge that you used to do things that were bad. Yeah. yeah well, Sean King, yeah. man, thank you so much. Appreciate um, you guys. And the next, and you're you're unveiling these things every couple of days. Yeah, the next piece comes out tomorrow, and uh, you'll New see. New York it. City, read up on this, man. This is our city, and we know some bad things that have happened in our town, in our city, and wherever you live, man. But um, I appreciate your work, man. Appreciate you. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you.